you. Hello, my name is Allison Dennis, and I serve as executive director for the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology. Welcome to all of you as we come together for our winter keynote with Michael Wimberly. While we are coming together virtually tonight, Sitka's roots are here on the North Central Oregon coast. We acknowledge and thank the first peoples and stewards of this place who today are actively represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Run and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. We want to thank Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation and Jordan Schnitzer for their extraordinary sponsorship of Sitka. And thank you to all of our generous sponsors and foundations, including Schwabi, Williamson and Wyatt, McMinimins, Scott Ceramics, Framing Resource, Brian Potter Design, Park Lane Suites, Lake Oswego Festival of the Arts, Palettes Northwest, Explore Lincoln City, Siltstone Wines, McLean's Printmaking Supplies, the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Robert and Mercedes Eicholtz Foundation, the Kinsman Foundation, Oregon Community Foundation, Oregon Arts Commission, and the Oregon Cultural Trust. I, this is, it takes a mega village to make a nonprofit happen today. Thank you, everyone. We want to thank Sitka's co-founders, Jane and Frank Boyden, and all 151 of Sitka's past and present board members, along with countless volunteers, members, and financial supporters for stewarding Sitka's treasured past, vibrant, present, and bright future. Along with tonight's keynote, Sitka is hosting two more online events this December. Next week on December 9th, MJ Jackson will facilitate an interactive conversation entitled, Are You Safer Outside? Exploring the roles open spaces play in our lives, who has access to them, who doesn't, and how the pandemic is changing our relationship with the outdoors. This event is hosted by Sitka, uh, and is part of the Oregon Humanities Conversation Project Series. So we hope you'll join us. And then our next resident talk will take place on December 16th. You can register for both of these free events through our website at sitkacenter.org. And we'll post the registration links in the chat to hear for you on the Zoom tonight. After Michael's presentation, I've invited past Sitka musician and resident Soraya Perry to help kick off the Q&A portion of tonight's program and get the conversation started musician to musician. If you have questions for Michael, please share them using the chat Q&A feature on your Zoom menu and I'll read your questions out loud. And now it is my joy to introduce our keynote speaker. Michael Wimberly is a composer, percussionist, educator and music producer based in Harlem, New York. He's recorded and toured with innovative artists such as Charles, Har excuse me, Charles Gale, Steve Coleman, William Parker, David Murray, and others, and earned his place in the pantheon of cutting edge avant-garde jazz drummers. I think it might be too late for me to earn my place in the cutting edge avant-garde uh, of jazz drummers. As soloist, Michael Wimberly has been featured with several European orchestras and his own orchestral compositions have been performed by symphonies in the US. Additional compositions appear in the dance company repertory of urban bushwomen, Joffrey II, Alvin Ailey, Philodansko, uh, excuse me, yes, Philodansko, Forces of Nature, Ailey II, Complexions Contemporary Ballet, Ballet Noir, Alpha Omega, Bal, Bal Ethnic, Pure Elements, and the National Song and Dance Company of Mozambique. Wimberly's documentary film, The Sound of Freedom, received an Arts International Award, and this work captures a musical portrait of the traditional dances and unique Mozambican xylophone, the, timb the timbala. Did I get that right? The timbala. timbala. Thank you. As the curator of the International Percussion Experience Power of Drum, an arts program whose mission is to make accessible to all youth, independent of social status, age, gender, and ethnic background, the learning of music and its relationship to the arts and sciences. Recent activities before the pandemic placed Wimberly coaching master classes at Tainan University in Taiwan, representing music in uh, Locri, Italy, and the Azores, and composing music for the Jerome Robbins Project Springboard Musical Residency, A Nation Grooves, A People's History of Hip Hop by Kambi Gath uh, Gathisa. That's correct. Great. A past year, 
uh, this past year brought Wimberley's latest release, Afrofuturism, on Temple Mountain Records. Michael has been on the faculty of Bennington College since 2012, which is where our paths first crossed. On a personal note, I love the way that Michael brings equal gravity and light to music making in all forms, whether he is playing the triangle in the back row of a community orchestra, performing an epic drum kit solo center stage, or fronting a college faculty James Brown cover band. As a person and as a musician, Michael, you are uplifting and an uprising force to me and on this good earth. I know technically everyone is muted, but sound has a way of traveling. So please, wherever you are, make some joyful noise and help me welcome Michael Wemberly to the Sitka Center. Thank you so much, Allison. That is such, such an honor to be here. We've talked about it. We were hoping it could happen earlier. It's happening now. I'm so grateful and honored to be a part of Sitka Center's uh, lecture series, performance series, and thank you for having me. Um, I would love to begin uh, just with playing a djembe drum, singing something in uh, Manding from the people of, of the Baga people of Guinea, a song that celebrates uh, and every every seven years uh, calling on on Kakilambe, a song to Kakilambe. It's a, a deity, mythologically, a deity that comes down out of the forest into the village to, to bless the village um, with crops, with a bounty of children, with health. And this is what we are doing today for, for you through this virtual medium. <laughs> so a little bit of Kakilambe. Maimbo, maimbo, mama, maimbo, kakilambe kekumbe. Maimbo, maimbo, mama, maimbo, kakilambe kekumbe. Kelly, oh, Kelly, oh, my Kelly. Kelly, oh, kakilambe kekumbe. Maimbo, maimbo, mama, maimbo, kakilambe kekumbe. Kakilambe. Uh, it's raining very heavy right now. I don't know if you can hear that, <laughs> but there's a, a wonderful sound on the top of this roof. So today I want to just bring you into um, a reflect on things that have made me fall in love with rhythm, fall in love with music, fall in love with dance, uh, just fall in love with life and Rhythm is in everything that we do, everything. You can't wake up without the feeling of rhythm in your body. Your heart beats in rhythm. You go and brush your teeth in rhythm. We speak in rhythm. We walk in rhythm. We dance in rhythm. Everything we do, our galaxies move around uh, in, throughout just rhythm. That's it. That's, seasons are rhythmic. So we're all tuned into that. Um, the water that I'm hearing 
falling on this roof where I'm at right now is falling in rhythm. It reminds me of a story where uh, I, many, many years ago, when I'm perhaps five or six years old, I would ask my mother, hey, mom, can you, do you hear the melody that's coming from the rain? And she, she couldn't hear it. She was like, what, what are you talking about? The, the melody from, from the rhythm of the rain. <laughs> but I was hearing things back at that age, uh, identifying the rhythm and melodies from the sound of car horns, um, trains, the sound of planes, everything. But of course, if you go back far enough on this planet anyway, before trains, cars, automobiles, um, you could hear the birds, the sound of nature. That's where rhythm and melody lives first. And if you listen, you could hear the drum when drums were invented. <laughs> they were used to call, to signal, to, to of course, pre cell phones and telephones. <laughs> um, they just, they were just used to call over distance. They, the sound would travel over distance. So if I wanted to play, that sound would travel. And that sound may signal that um, we've just, the village has just had another child born, or that might signal um, a wedding is happening, or that sound might signal uh, someone has passed. So, so rhythm has been always contained uh, within, within us as a human species. We've used rhythm in every aspect of life, mostly through rituals. We've lost that as we continue to advance as a people. We've lost it because we are, we're in a hurry or, or now our rhythm and music comes by way of our, our iPods or our headphones or comes through the radio in the car, whatever, whatever that might be. We're still connected rhythmically, but we don't use rhythm per se in those traditional ways. The fascinating thing for me as a child uh, in discovering rhythm as Allison mentioned earlier, the, the sound of James Brown was in the air in my time before Allison was even a twinkle in her mother's eye. <laughs> in that I, I fell in love with that sound of, of soul and funk and R&B and rock and those things connected me. But it was on the playground that rhythm, we discovered our rhythm in jumping rope in chasing each other, in, in creating games, vocal games um, that just had so much melody and, and rhyme to them. Um, this is, of course, pre-rap, but that, that was existing in, in much simpler forms, perhaps through, through beat poetry and things that we really weren't hearing on the radio. But things in the playground, that's, that's where a lot of rhythm, I think for everyone, uh, in, in, in the audience here, if you can think back in being on the playground, just, just the rhythm of the seesaw allows you to connect to rhythm. The rhythm of the merry-go-round and jumping on, jumping off needs rhythm. The, the rhythm of jumping rope has, you can't jump rope without some form of rhythm uh, in it. So we are all, we are rhythmic beings. Um, moving through life rhythmically and that consciously or unconsciously we are connected that way i wanted to um show share with you just some images initially to to just connect you with the things that inspire me and it's it's nature there are many things that inspire me but things that that i think about daily when I'm waking up, of course, the sun, <laughs> it gets me up every day, whether it's there or not, the sun, the moon, the stars, uh, the forest, the woods, water, 
insects, any whatever. It, it just snowed here. I'm in. Uh, I know Allison said I'm I'm uh, living in New York City, but I'm currently in in southern Vermont, and it snowed pretty heavy uh, the other day, and kind of a, a kiss to a, just to allow to to make us remember that winter is is coming. Winter is here on the East Coast. Um, so so that beautiful blanket of snow and how it fell, how it covers, how it how it shines, how it quiets, how it um, how it speaks, you know, just simply because it's it's part of nature. So let me see if I can share. OK, so you have in front of you the Atlantic Ocean. This could be from anywhere where there's land touching the Atlantic Ocean, but this particular place happens to be in Cuba uh, during a time when we could travel to Cuba a few years ago. So I went there to, to connect with, with the ancient rhythms, the ritual rhythms of Santeria uh, and study um, those specific rhythms that come from those religious practices. And just being on the coast um, was so calming, yet there were times when the thunderstorms would come through and rhythmically move the ocean and the waves. And it's just so interesting that our earth produces such um, rhythms that we can't even imagine sometimes. The sound of the ocean, uh, the waves lapping the shore, always changing, undulating. I said, rhythm has been used to call, signal, inspire, and celebrate since the dawn of time. And even though we were not created at the dawn of time, um, rhythm has been there. Rhythm has, has, through force, has created our galaxies, our planets, our stars. And part of that, and this this sun, this is also from Cuba, a sunset or sunrise actually, uh, above the mangrove uh, bushes, and just just these the calmness, the serenity of that, um, the rhythm of the day starting, the quietness. Yet you know that the, the, usually the day can bring on lots of other sounds and energy that produces additional rhythm. We're all working through the day and we all want uh, to be inspired, or I'm inspired by the sun for sure. <laughs> now we're waiting for the sun as we move into winter. And even in Oregon, it's you, I hear that you have beautiful sunsets. Um, even now the winter is affecting you, the rhythm of, of the the season is changing you. And how does that make you feel? Um, what kind of music and you know flows through you? What kind of movement do you do? What kind of dance do you do in the morning or at night? I know I love the moon and all of its its shapes, its uh, positions. Whenever I can see the moon, I always take that time to stop and think and reflect. And even though we've been seeing it all of our lives, it's still fascinating to see it in all of its majesty and all of its forms and all of its positions, always continuing to, to feed us poetically, um, spiritually. You know, it's always uplifting and nature, just to get back to, to nature. And just, I think we can all connect to nature and from whatever our experiences are, whether we go down to the beach, whether we go out for a hike, whether we go um, even in our backyards, that there's just, there's that moment of hearing. So next, so I challenge, well not challenge you, but I encourage you to, to think when you go out to a place where it's nature, really be conscious of what you're hearing and listen to those waves, listen to the, 
sound of the, the trees moving. Listen to the rain, listen to the wind, and listen to the varying uh, pitches of sound that comes through nature. So I'm gonna connect nature to the instrument I played earlier. And this instrument, many of you may know, it's called a djembe. Uh, and usually when I'm with kids, I say djembe, and you respond djembe, djembe drum, made from a tree trunk, covered with goatskin, tied with rope, yeah, and all that. <laughs> and it's a good time. But this instrument is, you can see it's in the shape of a goblet. It's very uh, old uh, shape, uh, usually used to to grind meal and 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 just beat. If this was if this wasn't here, it would and and there was no hole in it because there is a hole in there. Uh, usually, it would be used to just pound meal and prepare some sort of um, bread or flour or something. But over the years. Uh, there's been a hole placed into it and that's given it a voice and the inside of it is very, how shall I say, um, not smooth. Uh, it's very rough. It's a rough surface. So it allows for sound to be very clear and focused. Um, so it doesn't bounce around like a smooth surface. And up here is just a, a goat skin and it's tied with rope and it's hollow on the inside. And the interesting thing about connecting it to nature and connecting it to our language um, is the tonality from it. And this, this applies to all drums, really. But we as speakers, we have a low, a low sound to our voice sometimes, you know, and then we have a middle sound and a middle tone, and then we have a high tone or a high pitch. And the, and the drum functions that way too. So you can hear it. That would be a nice bass sound. You move your hand to the edge, changes it. It's a nice tone. And for a little more impact for the higher pitch, I'm going to do a slap. So three pitches, although they're more, three pitches determine uh, what you can create on this instrument. And since this instrument has really hundreds of years behind it, just like a violin, piano, you'd be surprised how many rhythms exist on the djembe alone. The djembe being out of West Africa, Mali, Guinea, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, moving down into Ghana, Nigeria. But um, so it's traveled, it's migrated. And what happens when you migrate? You continue to, add, if it was food, <laughs> you continue to add to it. You continue to make different recipes. You continue, uh, in this case, put different languages on it. So everything from Wolof out of Senegal to Manding and, and Mandingo out of Mali and Guinea and so many other regions uh, have created numerous rhythms that are directly connected to the language that they're speaking. And the interesting thing about um, drums like this or tonal drums they they do really reflect the language for example if i were if, if i could show you wish i had a talking drum you've seen the drums where people hold them under their arm and they're squeezed and they play with like a curved stick maybe you've seen those uh, out of nigeria and and senegal and they 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 mimic their language it's that's why they call them talking drums uh, if i say modupwe it's like saying, you know, how are you? So the, they have a very, in Ghana and Nigeria, they have a very tonal language. But in, in Senegal, it's a very sharp language. Their drums are very different, um, similar, but different. Uh, and and their, their, their language in Wolof is much faster it's a faster language uh if, if i were to say you know how are you you would say man magnificent so negadef many so negadef is how are you many is a magnificent i'm fine you see the sharp i can play it sharp 
and that would mimic more of their sound. Nengadev, Nengadev, Menifarek, Menifarek. Whereas uh, a tonal language that I mentioned, like uh, Modupwe uh, from Nigeria, it's a little more difficult to do it on a flat surface, a drum that I can't squeeze, but. sound but a middle range sound in their language in general it's not that they don't speak high pitch they do <laughs> but it's you would need a much smaller talking drum to hit that pitch or to mimic that those words so what we've discovered or learned over these these amazing cultures have created language on instruments that connect to their their drum, drumming style or their drumming uh, traditions. The same with drums out of India. Uh, if you have uh, tabla drums out of the north that are playing very complex rhythms that are mimicking poetry that has been written in Hindi um, and very connected to the language and the tonality and the pitch of their language, the drums mimic that. And I just, I just think it's fascinating uh, to to encounter these cultures uh, with these ancient rhythms from from you know centuries old uh, that we don't we're not so privy to because they're just not playing them on the radio they're playing them now it's, America is is much more open uh, to listening to music from around the world and and hopefully we are traveling well we are we're traveling more and so we're we're privy to seeing um, these and hearing beautiful music, rhythms, dress, clothes, dance from various places that are, are hopefully informing us of the, the, the mosaic fabric of, of us as a people on the planet. This is a really diverse world and we need to, we need to see it. Um, so that's, that's something I just wanted to connect, bring nature, into the tonality of the drum and how nature has really created the drum in a sense, especially since we're using, um, in this case, and, and I don't want to offend anyone, uh, goat skin. <laughs> so so um, there are, for those who don't uh, deal with any animal products, there are drums that, that have uh, used synthetic skins nowadays uh, that mimic the same sound. It's just, um, it's just, a, and keep in mind too that, that in this case, something I, I didn't mention was when you make a, a drum like this, or at least the tradition is to go and ask the tree for permission. There's a prayer before that, there are rituals. Asking the tree, I mean, can you imagine, I mean, we, do we ask trees, can we cut you down? For the most part, we don't. We have evolved into that type of culture, nation of, you know, this, economically, we're just going to wipe out the trees and we're going to make what we need to make. And we, we fail to even learn about uh, the respect of nature through other cultures, where we're asking the tree, can we, for permission to cut it down? You know, I mean, you know, it's it's amazing. I I, I have videos of this, uh, and the care, and the ritual of of every step of designing an instrument like this, because the instrument becomes the voice of the people, and the respect of the spirit of the tree. It's life, right? So it it's a living thing. And they are asking for that permission uh, uh, to allow it to continue to live, but in a different way. So that's that's fascinating to me. Um, one thing that I encountered, or um, in my studies in New York City, I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, 
But once I arrived in New York City uh, and went to grad school, and I was next to a, a church called Riverside Church. And in that community, um, you have Columbia University, Riverside Church, uh, and just a number of, of community events that bring people together, such as the Dance Mobile, where they bring in a, a truck and modern dance companies would dance uh, or African dance companies would dance uh, for the community, or they bring in a jazz truck called Jazz Mobile, and then famous people would be there like Dizzy Gillespie, Lionel Hampton, you know, much older, older, but very successful jazz artist for free, <laughs> you know, and so that was pretty amazing. So while I was in college, I, a dear friend who was studying the, the organ, classical organ and the music of Bach and, and Handel and Haydn and uh, uh, those great European masters, uh, he also played djembe. <laughs> right. uh, and there's a dear friend named Craig Brown. And so he introduced me to this instrument and, uh, and several bits of culture from it. And in the interim, by the time I arrived in New York City, uh, I could hear in the distance on one of the dance mobiles some of the rhythms that he taught me. And I, you know, it was such an emotional moment. I mean, I, I just ran towards that sound and to see the dances, because we had actually put a little dance company together in college. And it was just fascinating to actually, now I'm actually seeing real professionals do this and play. And that was, uh, that immediately connected me to, to the community in uh, New York City. And that was with a company helmed by the man named Chuck Davis, but also another company called Forces of Nature, uh, who I am still with as, as a musician, as a composer, uh, after all of these years. And that particular group connected me with the great um, Grammy Award winning musician and, and uh, composer Paul Winter. So that's, that's, there's just interesting how connections are made uh, and I had no idea that that would happen, but that's and it's something I learned in school. And the next thing you know, I'm in New York City. And the next thing you know, I'm I'm working with uh, these professional companies. So I say that to say uh, that I really started to emerge myself into uh, African drumming and everything: Haitian drumming, uh, Cuban drumming, <laughs> Dominican drumming. It didn't matter. Yet I was a drum set player and a marimba player. So that was the main, you know, those were my main tools. And, and I just continued to grow over the years. And out of that, I began to produce uh, an event. Um, and this one particular event, I, I called Power of Drum. Not the Power of Drum, just Power of Drum. It just came to me. And it was to celebrate the great architect of drum set playing, Max Roach. Now, I don't know if who knows Max Roach uh, in this audience, but Max Roach was one of the great uh, architects and innovators of bebop jazz drumming. And so Max Roach played with Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie back in that early time. Uh, everyone, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, um, just, just, uh, just a slew of, of great uh, home, you know, home name artists, jazz artists uh, who were all innovative. And so I had, you know, times over the years to meet Max Roach, but he was ailing at this point um, on the edge of early Alzheimer's and uh, in a facility to support, support his incapacity to, to take care of himself. So I wanted to give uh, a tribute and all of a sudden the doors open for me to do that. And so I organized people who had worked with him, who had been inspired by him. Um, just, just, you know, just, I did what I could do and to put on a show. And so I wanted to share a little bit of that show with you. Uh, and it's all rhythmic based. <laughs> uh, so the power of drum basically brings 
or highlights drummers and percussionists kind of shines a light on them. Most of the times drummers are in the back of the band. I'm bringing them forward, right? So you're going to see uh, some excerpts. It's going to be about, I don't know if we could get through it all, but this is going to be about six minutes. <laughs> is, is that okay? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's quite entertaining. Um, but what happened was power of drum, I, all of a sudden that was a successful event and I did it again and I did it again and I did it again. I kept doing them year after year. And here is a series of excerpts that I'm, I think you'll enjoy. Um, and if it feels long, I might stop it just to be able to re-engage. Uh, and I can tell you that, you know, this exists on YouTube, so you can go look at it as you wish. You can see it. <laughs>
just to encourage you to go and look at it <laughs> online uh, just to see the rest. I've stopped at Bobby Sanabria, but it was just so in beautiful to see the, the learning, the language between the little boy, his name's uh, Miguel Russell, and his teacher, um, Don Eaton. But now that little boy has grown up. He's a professional drummer, drum set player. And we've had uh, over the years, just so many young, young artists come through that are now out in the world, internationally touring and performing. But, it, but it's nice to have a, a group of friends uh, with that level of talent, you know, uh, to come by and, and do things for you. And just, um, I've been just lucky to, through drumming, uh, to meet so many other percussionists, so many drummers, so many composers uh, that are so innovative and, and unique uh, from all over the world. And uh, the interesting that, although we don't want the pandemic, that this particular um, medium of Zoom uh, has allowed us to connect with people from all over the planet and just, um, you know, really, really uh, have some, some really rich uh, conversations and opportunities to have you, you know, like I'm in your living room, you know, uh, so that's pretty awesome. So that was um, Power of Drum continued uh, to evolve. And as it did for, I ended up going to um, other places on the planet. So one particular place that I took Power of Drum to was the Azores, as they would call it, the Azores, uh, the Portuguese uh, community off the coast of Portugal, about a two hour flight back uh, from, from uh, Lisbon. So the best route to the Azores is a group of nine islands. The, the fastest route that's not as harm, uh, doesn't hurt your body so much, let's say that. It's from Boston straight into the main island, Sao Miguel or St. Michael's. I mean, no wonder I, I liked it. It was, it was named after me. So um, I went there, I don't think in 2009 or somewhere around there, and, and, and I went consistently for 10 years straight until the pandemic hit. And so that's been a great community for me to uh, broaden and connect and bring the power of drum into that community. So I wanna share with you some photos from that just to see, uh, um, for you to see some of the, the things that I had, the tools that I had to use because we didn't have the drums. Um, and just the excitement of building community through, through art, um, using, in this case, my, my talent uh, and my love for teaching and my love for, for connecting with young people. Um, I was able to, to implement a program uh, what I'm going to show you just the early, earlier, some photos from the earlier years, but over the years, uh, I was asked and invited to, to create a school uh, called Music for Many, uh, but in Portuguese. And I, I, out of the nine islands, I've, I've gone to, I think, five of them, um, bringing this idea of, of drumming, building community, uh, and also, you know, I am an improvising artist, so um, that's that's one aspect of it. Some people are hardcore jazz lovers; they want to hear me do that. They don't want, you know, they don't want to care so much about the me connecting with school children. But it's like I I have these tools that I can connect to both worlds, and that's been just oh, just really lovely. So I'm going to share my screen again. Um, we and created something called Power of Drum at Escuela Canto de Maya. And it was just um, an artist uh, whose a school was named after him. But I brought, again, the program into to many schools. And these are just some of my, my, my colleagues now. I'm not getting, okay. So as you can see, I put Sitka up there, show you some love. But um, look what the children are playing. A, a, a big, so we, we repurpose a lot of things. We we're able to find some small drums, but we repurpose um, just cans, buckets, bottles, everything that you could possibly think of. 
And in the early years, I just went out to a community that was underserved. Um, this is a fishing community, you know, it's an island. So, so that's, that's how they make their living, or at least some of these kids' parents. But we used, you know, garbage cans, buckets. I just asked, like, can you find me a bunch of buckets? Uh, I'll bring the sticks. Let's just give me a place. Connect me with kids who are not having access, who are just having some, some challenges. But one interesting thing, in the er again, in the, the early parts of me coming into this community, um, these kids, someone from Brazil came in and they were teaching them capoeira, the martial arts form of dance and um, and the birumbau, the big long stick you see there, we, you saw you saw it in in one of the earlier uh, videos. A guy was playing that from Brazil, so it's a really wonderful exercise and art form that they were able to pass on uh, in that community. And then I came in and just taught basic rhythms or whatever they felt they wanted to play. I just guided them on that, and you can see we're playing oil cans. You know, just trying to repurpose those into instruments. Um, and there were some great sounds from those. So, you know, you don't want to see these things thrown into the earth um, or into the water or any of that. You want to just, you know, utilize them as best as you can. Uh, and in this case, <laughs> we found ways to turn them into music. So uh, I was able to organize, uh, I called this, uh, well, we were able to work with a, a, a small circus that was there, a number of clowns and, and people in the circus arts, uh, along with a jazz musician. If you can see in the upper left screen, a jazz, I must have been there with a jazz group. That's why he's there. But I also had uh, this other thing going on with the children. And so we were just out in the open air for the public, uh, sharing what we had learned and what we were doing with each other. Um, through this music and through the dance and using art as a transformative power uh, in a small community. I mean, these kids, um, if I can kind of just try to remember, oh, there we go, I'll just jump here. I just called it Azorian Circus Drum Parade because that's kind of what we were doing. It was a combination of, of um, clowning around, um, but using music to connect and inspire and with um, repurposing um, objects that need to be recycled, uh, turning them into music, musical instruments. So that was really cool. And, you know, and I can't wait to get back. And then this just shows you this another, this is a whole nother area in Yakima, Washington, closer to you, uh, where I've overseen drum circles of some pretty, pretty heavy numbers. And that was just another community I was using, you know, working, I won't, I won't go into this. Um, another, another community that I worked with for a number of years, uh, building, using drumming. Yeah. So that's a small smidgen. <laughs> But right now, uh, what do we have Soraya joining us, right? Yeah, welcome, Soraya. Uh, I'll hand it over to you to just uh, get the conversation uh, going. I know you've been researching Michael's music and his work. And then uh, folks in the audience, if you do have a question or an insight you want to share, feel free to type that into the Q&A or the chat, and I'll just leave in those comments. But uh, welcome, Soraya. Great to have your voice in the conversation. Thank you. And thank you so much, Michael. That was such a, that was so beautiful to hear. And I was like, so moved by those photos that you just shared. Um, I had kind of been taking notes throughout your talk and have been kind of building questions that I want to ask you. But after seeing those photos, I immediately, my, my immediate first question is just, what is your experience building connection through music and how how do you recommend that other musicians or just other people um, find ways to harness connection through music? I love that those in those photos you shared that it was so clear that so much was improvisational, so much was just off the cuff, like let's just use these found objects to create rhythm and to create connection with others and to create whimsy and joy. And that's something that I'm trying to 
think about in my own life and my own work, how I can take the work that I do at home or by myself and reflect it back out to others and bring it into public space. And I'm just very curious if you have any like, you know, practical tips for the mindset to be in when you're when you're trying to to, to harness that power or um, how you can kind of create and curate those spaces so that people can exist in joy and in music together, even if they don't necessarily have, you know, a music background. No, excellent question, and and uh, I'm you know I hope I have uh, some some tips for that. I mean, for me, I was able to get mentored through working with dance companies, um, specifically um, Forces of Nature, because they had a lecture demonstration wing to the to their program, and so they were funded uh, through organizations like Arts Connection. Uh, or other uh, New York State Foundation for the Arts, or, or in this case, you can have an Oregon State uh, Foundation for the Arts, or any any organization. Just as Allison mentioned at the beginning of this program, that thanking so many sponsors because it does take a lot to to run a, a nonprofit. So how do you you know do you want to be a nonprofit or in the early years? Because uh, it's a lot of work, but in the early years, do you, it's easy to think it's easy to go and volunteer just to get the feel of the land. And if you can connect with a mentor, that would be ideal because they can help shape your work and fine tune it just to have a conversation like, hey, you know, I've got uh, I've got 10 songs that I want to sing. And, you know, do you think kids would like this? I, I don't know. You know, we, you could specifically go and and um, I would say like the music that I bring into schools when I do volunteer I make that rhythmic connection i'm going in and i'm singing songs that i've learned in Swahili in Yoruba you know in Portuguese in Spanish. Uh, and i'm using that as a platform to connect and and build Community just to make a connection and then i'm also using sign language too. Uh, with the mantra of peace, love, respect for everyone. So, you know, you could do peace, love, respect for everyone. And you and you connect with with just the idea of children, not some know that people can't hear and some don't know. And so just but that mantra of peace, love and respect for everyone is something that I embrace because I've learned that from uh, the great impresario, the late Chuck Davis, who continued to uh, who created Dance Africa, someone you should look up. And so we do that a lot. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't bring I didn't do that for this program, though. Please forgive me. But <laughs> maybe we'll close with that. But um, the whole point being that as I collect vocabulary, songs, rhythms, uh, even, even I remember being hired to come into a school to help kids read. I turned all of their books or their stories into songs. Now it's great that I'm a songwriter, it makes it easy. They remembered all the books, all the stories, you know? So that was, that, you know, luckily I had that tool in my set, in my toolkit. But as you, as you begin to figure out how to curate a program that you can bring into a community, I would advise going to a, a museum, local museum, or, or be bold, go to the biggest museum that's there, you know, and bring you, but you have to have a proposal of what you want to do and how you are going to uh, bring in a community to connect with the museum's work or something that you'd like to suggest as a curation. And that could be a way to bring in music, dance, um, fashion, uh cuisine there's ways to do that then you can also yes i was just going to say it's such a timely question and uh your response michael uh for sika we we've, we've just in the last year launched a new youth program that uh, uh goes directly to coastal schools and we've been excited about the idea of having sika residents like sharing them with the community in ways we haven't been able to before but i had not thought about it from the perspective of Soraya's question about that it's actually there are barriers to you as an artist 
connecting with the community or, or reaching kids in a in a structured way without having to start your own nonprofit. So it's a, it's really uh, you're 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 making some connections for me right now. Soraya, did you yeah, have other, and <laughs> some other questions or angles? You yes, to absolutely. And just on that point, you know, I was just sharing with someone yesterday that a very impactful experience I had was the first time I ever performed for people in a school, and that was actually through a Sitka program. We did a concert. Um, with some with a local coastal school and it's just amazing to hear like much younger people reflect back their music exper their experience of music because to me it's often so much more poetic and pure and they're able to really identify like oh you know that sounded very good to me that sounded very you know they can talk about music in much in, in my mind, much purer ways, really divorced from some idea of music as it is as like a cultural concept or anything. And that's like such a beautiful thing to share with, with other human beings. Um, so that's just all so interesting. And I'm so moved by that element of your work, Michael. Um, I think just in everything that you've been talking about and, and uh, what uh, I've seen in your work as I've been listening to it is, is I, I, the importance of the international and the global perspective is, is really, really interesting. The emphasis on like how many different ways, how many different instruments, how many different people can create rhythm and how that can uh, speak to a universal language that we have. And also that a diversity of language really helps us understand new, new ways of connecting with music. And as you're saying, like using ASL or using different languages or thinking about how language then connects to, to rhythm and like the history and ancestry of how instruments are created. I think that's like so beautiful. And one question I have for you or just something that I've been thinking about and meditating on recently is um, how as the internet grows bigger and we evolve musically uh, and we share and take more and more pieces that there's so many new hybrid genres existing today, that there's so many people collaborating in new ways. And I think that's really, really, really beautiful. But I'm curious if you, like how you conceptualize that, whether you feel uh, nervousness about us losing certain like lineages or histories or ancestries as they like warp and become like new hybrid versions of what they were 100 years ago and just in general yeah what you're thinking about that diversity and how it's in a period of deep change well it is in a, a period of deep change and, and Soraya that's a, a very intriguing question uh that I'm always thinking about you know <laughs> how, how to preserve uh I, I always try to bring my students and lead them to these amazing traditions you know and and, and just open up their sound palette to, to understand that there are musics that are so old, uh, that are equally, uh, that are much older than our, than our classical, what's called European classical music, which is fantastic music, but there are other tra folkloric traditions on the planet that are mind blowing that, and, and you need to be aware of them. And so I'm around a number of, of young musicians who are producers and writers, and I'm saying you need to learn how to listen to this music respectfully, but incorporate it, be inspired by it. Don't appropriate it, but, but be inspired by it and figure out how to allow it to inspire you so that you can expand in this hybrid uh, uh, era that we're in. You know, we're mixing and matching all of these different song forms and languages. So, so it's, I think it's, I, there's a saying from, uh, a famous group out of Chicago, uh, the Art Ensemble of Chicago, that were more uh, improv improv improvisers and composers from the 60s, 70s, 80s. And, and I borrow a, a line they use, I think they call the album Ancient to the Future. So the idea of something so old and ancient, yet it's, it is so innovative that it's, it's moving to the future. And how do you incorporate that? And for me, that's what my Afrofuturism concepts are it's like you know really now i mean i'm like i'm the future now right wow but i'm using all of these old elements these amazing tools that have been created by my ancestors you know and and the incorporation of western technology with ancient african technology and i'm fusing that and that's 
that's where I'm coming from with it. And it's not that the songs have to have some like futuristic sound, uh, you know, it, no, but, but it, it, it varies for everyone, whatever ancient to the future is for everyone. But we are in this moment right now. And, and I think a lot about that next sound. I'm always mm -hmm. searching for it. This is very interesting because, you know, if there's one thing I, I'm so curious about with your work, it's, it's how you define Afrofuturism and what those aesthetic principles of Afrofuturism mean to you, because this is something that um, my, both my brothers are musicians and we, we sit together and debate what Afrofuturism means to us because it seems like something that we are defining live in the moment. We're learning more and more like, okay, we can define it as this and this, and it can be so many different things, so many different artists. And I loved going to your record and hearing so many, uh, what felt like ancient or traditional classical um, sounds, tones, rhythms, uh, patterns, and understanding them as defined as also futuristic and that Afrofuturism can be something so much more than just like, oh yeah, you know, like boop, 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 fancy computer, you know, right, though right. it is that too. And it's all such a beautiful celebration. So if you have any, I guess my last question would be like, how are you defining Afrofuturism right now? And where do you hope it goes? Well, Sarai, you framed it so beautifully just now. <laughs> uh, in, in your your interpretation of it and the expression is, is powerful, it's beautiful. It is now. Um, I'm pulling from, you know, I fell in love with Sun Ra and, and the early uh, um, pioneers of it, Funkadelics, um, you know, Patti LaBelle and, and, and the Bluebells and um, just so many, you know, Sly and the family. So all of that was Afrofuturistic. You know, they yeah. were cutting edge musically. Um, I have to, there was a question about Alvin Ailey. I'm going to say Alvin Ailey was an Afrofuturist in, in that uh, the work um, bringing, bringing uh, Black life, women empowerment into the work, moving it forward, um, and questioning it. Um, the power of of some of the filmmakers that have created even even through black exploitation of uh, that era of the 70s contributed to some of the tenets of Afrofuturism that informed artists like you know Beyonce and and Janelle Monet and uh, um, um, you know just the names are going to slip but I can't I can't pull the names like I used to but uh, just some of the creative innovative artists of today that are contributing to the direction and you know push the envelope you have to put that's where the future of, of afrofuturism is going to be don't deny who you are you know uh some people don't want afro because there's no afro land it's a hairstyle so and it's it's also a, a, a word that europeans coined for africa just to know that history but it but we've embraced it now it's afro cuban it's afro caribbean it's afro this it's afrofuturism uh, I know artists who are like, I'm not Afrofuturist, I'm a futurist, <laughs> you know, fine. We are constantly redefining terminology. It's just, it's in our nature as, as human beings. So I just love, I would love to hear what your brothers and you are doing <laughs> and just to, you know, like pull my ear. Um, that's why, that's why I'm in, a, uh, that's why I teach uh, around young people just to constantly be fed I new ideas, new ways of approaching, you know, I don't want that. You just have to keep an open mind. That's so beautiful. Thank you. I, I will, I'll let you answer Nancy's question. But yeah, I do you want to speak just a little bit more to <laughs> some of your uh, experiences collaborating with dancers and dance companies, whether uh, Alvin Ailey or just other insights there, and then I'll, uh, I'll bring this to a close. You know, I met Alvin Ailey uh, just by happenstance, I was in this school in New York City, a community college, Borough of Manhattan Community College. It was getting paid just a, a wage that would make you cry. But I was just coming out of grad school. I didn't have a job. I didn't really know, you know, there was no mentorship in my life at that moment, or maybe I didn't recognize nice it. But here it is. All of a sudden, a friend said, hey, do you want to cover some dance classes for me at Manhattan School of Music, um, uh, Borough of Manhattan Community College? I said, sure. So Alvin Ailey and his whole company, who I didn't know, uh, were in 
in residence there. Uh, and I met the great Judith Jamison uh, and Pearl Reynolds and just a number of his top dancers at that time. And I recall sitting with Alvin one time, he was putting what's called the yellow section of Revelations, the great Revelations, his work on some students. And I mean, he's sitting side by side. And he says, what do you think of that? Well, I thought it was beautiful. But I had never seen Revelations, so I didn't know what to compare it to. I was also simultaneously working at the Martha Graham School, where Martha Graham would, would come in. She was in wheelchair at the time, but um, she would come into class and listen. And it was a pretty full class. And due to my limitations, I learned how to, or I, I started to use the djembe and piano at the same time. So I was constantly, you know, just rhythm and the melodies and harmony, I was working it out. I don't know how I did, but I just did it. And so um, just long story short, Martha Graham gave me a grand piano to support my efforts as a musician. I still have that piano today. <laughs> and I just so happened to teach, um, just by the way, I have five ballets in the Alvin Ailey in the company over the years, I started to compose for the company. But but here now that I'm at Bennington College, um, I am literally um, presenting. Well, I'm just finishing up a class called Music Compositions for Dance that looks at the history of 20th century history of some of the leading choreographers, dance companies, and composers, uh, and just you know just helping students understand who these great innovators were and are, and at the same time the students. Uh, have to collaborate, create compositions, create dance, improvisation, and we were pre we're presenting all of that this Sunday uh, at in our one of our wonderful facilities here at Bennington College. So uh, I could go on and on about Alvin Ailey, but yeah, what what a what a what a mind. There's a comment in the chat. I've been teaching African rhythms and drumming for 28 years, still a beginner. So grateful for the learning and how it has transformed my life. Good to hear Michael's history and stories. Love this. So thank, thank you, you Zuri, thank for you. sharing thank that. You, uh, appreciate that. And uh, Michael, is there anything else you wanted to say in uh, close? Well, um, you know, what What an amazing opportunity to, to, to reconnect with my dear friend, Allison. Uh, to meet Zariah and the team of, of Nicola and, and Tamara and Sitka community. Thank you so much for for just having this series. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, you know, you take a moment to explore some things. If you want my music, it's on Bandcamp, uh, a couple albums on there, or just go on YouTube and listen to it for free. Hey, I don't care. <laughs> but um, I really appreciate that. And you know, of course, I want to close with peace, love, and respect for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, thank you again. And I, you know, I hope to get out there at some point when all of this madness is behind us. Yes, please. Uh, Soraya, thanks for your contributions and making the conversation richer. Um, thank you Michael. for having me. Yeah, Michael, thank, you, thank Michael. you for inviting us into your sound cloud, your thank sound you. palette. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting us to, or reminding us that the moon rising each night is an invitation to figure out what dance we want to do. And, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of Pacific Northwesterners uh, listening in to this conversation. And yet, uh, for me at least, you helped me hear the rain in a way I've never heard it before. So uh, thank you for that all the way from uh, the upstairs attic of Vermont, <laughs> Bennington College. <laughs> we'll wish uh, Michael and Soraya a good night. Thank you everyone for tuning in and looking forward to seeing you at some more of our virtual conversations this December. Good night, everybody. Thank you all. Good night. Yeah.